great to be with you. It's always a blessing to be here. Um, interesting time right now, isn't it, in our world? Um, a lot of people live in fear uh, because of COVID. Um, I encounter it everywhere I go, and uh, <clears throat> I hope the words that I share with you this morning will be an encouragement. I, I'd like to title these thoughts, Jesus never wastes anything. Everything that comes along, if we take it in the right spirit, God uses it in our lives, and I want to share a little bit personally with you. But before I do, I'm going to read, and I, um, I, I'm going to read from the Phillips translation, modern English, James chapter 1, beginning with verse 2 to verse 5. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers and sisters, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let this process go on until you become people of mature character with the right sort of independence. And if in the process any of you does know, not know how to meet any particular need, he has only to ask God, who gives generously to all people, without be making them feel foolish or guilty, and he may be sure that the necessary wisdom will be given him. Really encouraging words. Um, Jesus never wastes anything. I want to share with you a little personal experience with this. Um, earlier this year, must have been about April, I went in for my annual physical. And my doctor said, your PSA is a little bit high. Um, and uh, so um, I'd like to have you get an MRI. So I went and had an MRI and uh, I come back to meet with him and he says, um, something looks suspicious. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna do a biopsy. That's not a lot of fun. Some of you have had one of those and that's taken a little bit of your skin and so on and uh, analyzing it. So I had the biopsy and uh, a week later met with my doctor and found out I had cancer, uh, prostate a, a cancer, a very fast growing type. And at that point then you start going from doctor to doctor and they send you here and there and so on. And uh, um, it ended up where I, I thought maybe surgery was the best thing to do. And I found out <laughs> for somebody my age, that's probably a little bit risky. I'm just a young fellow, just 76, but uh, <laughs> they thought that was a little too old. So, uh, um, so the doctor recommended proton radiation uh, treatments. And I was able, I live in Washington, D.C., and work at a place called The Cedars, um, and uh, where we host a lot of friends from around the world and are connected with the National Prayer Breakfast. And so I, um, I began that process about the 1st of October. Four weeks every day, you'd go into the hospital. And as I said, God never wastes I had an amazing experience. You know, what's interesting is, is you, you meet a lot of wonderful doctors and nurses, but everybody else that's there has cancer. I'd, oftentimes I would come and I'd be sitting and you, they'd put a little, a little gown on you and you go in and get on the gurney for about 15 or 20 minutes and the radiation uh, comes and it's, it's painless. It's, it was a relatively easy process. But I met so many people. So I'd be sitting there and somebody else would be across the way in their gown and, uh, and I'd say, hi, I'm Doug. What's your name? And tell me your story. I heard a lot of different stories, had a chance to pray with people. Um, sometimes there were tears involved. What I encountered is a lot of people were very fearful about this. Um, I didn't have one iota of fear. I think the reason is I realized what's the worst thing that would happen? I'd go to be with Jesus. 
is that bad news? Now, that's a little earlier than what I'd planned, but you know, what a great place to be with him. So I didn't have one iota of fear, um, but I met a whole lot of wonderful people. I heard a lot of stories. Um, a lot of tears were shed. Um, what a great experience. At the end of the four weeks, the last day, I'm sliding off the gurney and two of the nurses are standing there <laughs> and they go, Mr. Burley, by the way, you know you're old when everybody calls you Mr. And, and I would say, no, 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 I'm Doug. Mr. Burley's my father, okay? Okay, Mr. Burley. <laughs> so these two nurses are standing there and they go, you know, Mr. Burley, you're the perfect patient. You're always on time, you're always happy, and you know all of our names. Then you go out in the hall and you ring the bell. It's kind of neat, you know. All the doctors and nurses are around and you ring the bell. That means I'm done. I think they got it. We'll kind of check in every once in a while to find out. But Jesus never wastes anything. I have to say that experience was one of the best of my life. I met a lot of wonderful people. I heard a lot of stories. I learned a lot of names, but more than the names, I heard their stories. You know, um, I just believe Jesus allowed me to experience that. And you know what? He never wastes anything. So let me personalize this for you. We live in a pretty fearful world right now. A lot of people very afraid of COVID. Um, you know, everybody tells us even after all the shots, I've had three of them, wear your mask, do this, do that, do this. You know, and a lot of people just are fearful. They stay home, they don't go anywhere. They, they don't talk to anybody. Um, so what is it for you that is bringing you anxiety or fear? right now in your life. And I'd like to suggest something to you. Today, offer that to Jesus. Give it to him. You know, 1 John 4, well, uh, let me read it to you. It's a wonderful passage. 1 John 4, 17 and 18. Again, I'm going to read it in the Phillips. So our love for him grows more and more, filling us with complete confidence for the day when he will judge all people. For we realize that our life in this world is actually his life lived in us. That's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. The King James says, as he is, so are we in this world. Let me read it once more. We, for we realize that our life in this world is actually his life lived in us. That's why we take the most difficult, painful things in our lives and we offer them to him. And then he says, love contains no fear. Indeed, fully developed love expels every particle of fear. For fear always contains some of the torture of feeling guilty. The man who lives in fear has not had yet had his love perfected. Another translation says, there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. So what is it that we're fearful about? Last Sunday night, I had an interesting experience. I... Uh, I send out about 325 Christmas letters, and, uh, and it's, a, it, it's a pretty arduous thing. I, I write on every one of them, okay? I, I think if I'm paying 55 cents, I wanna, I wanna write those people some, so I'll write three or four lines, and it's a lot of work. And uh, <clears throat> I finished the other night and sang the Hallelujah Chorus, you know, and went to the, the mail, the post office and had a stack about that high and dumped them all in there, okay? But um, with it, we uh, have a picture, and it's my wife and I, and we have 16 grandchildren. All, all four of our kids had four, just like we planned, not really. Uh, eight boys, eight girls. So what we do is we have 
uh, our picture, and then four, 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 and four, okay? And um, but my, my daughter-in-law puts the thing together, and she said, you want me to put Merry Christmas, Love, Doug and Debbie? I said, yeah, that'd be nice. So I go to the Bartels drugstore to pick up the, and, and, and I notice that, that they cropped off half of the Merry Christmas, Love, Doug and Debbie. So I called my wife, ladies, this is what we need to do as husbands. And I said, honey, is this acceptable to send to our friends? <laughs> and it took her about a half a second to say, absolutely not. Go back to the drugstore. <laughs> So I went back, and I had this thing, and I, you know, I'd paid $65 for it. I thought, well, they probably need to do it over. So a young 25-year-old guy comes out, and, um, and right away, I have my mask on, like I'm supposed to in the store, and right away, he goes like this. It just jumps back, you know. I, he was, didn't want to get close to me at all. And I told him the situation, and he said, oh, I don't think we can do anything. You know, we just put it on there, and however it comes out, you know. I go, really? I said, well, my son's on the phone, and he was the one that sent the email, and he can show you the email that it, it was done differently than the way you did it. And so I reach over to hand him my phone, and he jumps back, and he goes, J just a minute, and he goes to get a, a plastic glove to put on his hand so he can take the phone. Oh, my. So he talks to my son, and a, minute, a few minutes later, he goes, no, he says, we can't help you, I'm sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> the next morning, my son went over and uh, met with a person that was a, a, a little bit more customer friendly, and they did it over again, okay? But I thought about this guy. I, I, I'm, I'm not his judge, but really? We live our life that way? So we're so fearful to be in touch with anybody. Gee, we might, we might get COVID. We might get this or that. And so many people live that way. What is it for each of us this Christmas that we will give back to Jesus that causes us fear or anxiety? Maybe it's a money challenge. Maybe it's a relationship with a relative or someone that has been very difficult for us to get along with, that causes us fear or anxiety or anger. Jesus never wastes anything. Offer that as a gift back to him. And you know what? He'll bless you with it. Um, interesting, as I left the hospital the last time, I got in my car and I thanked the Lord for a wonderful month with a bunch of great people that he really used it in my life and I think maybe he might have even used me in some other people's lives people that were living in fear and anxiety and somebody came along and listened to their story and told them about Jesus the one who's the great physician who loves us who knows everything about us who meets us in the midst of every one of those challenges. As we think about this Christmas season, I want to mention two people to you. They're only mentioned once in the scripture. Uh, you never hear about them again. But I, I was interested and drawn to these two people as I thought about this wonderful season that we're in right now, and I'd like to share it with you. The first one is an old man named Simeon. In Jerusalem, there was at this time a man by the name of Simeon. He was an upright man, devoted to the service of God, living in the expectation of the restoration of Israel. His heart was open to the Holy Spirit, and it had been revealed to him that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Christ. He'd been led by the Spirit to go into the temple, and when Jesus' parents brought the child in to have done to him what the law required, he took him up in his arms, blessed God, and said, Now, Lord, you are dismissing your servant in peace. As you promised, for my, with my own eyes I have seen your salvation, which you made ready for the people, all peoples, to see, a light 
to show truth to the Gentiles and bring glory to the people of Israel. Let's think about Simeon for a minute. You never hear about him anywhere else except this little passage in the second chapter of Luke. But he was somebody that loved God, worshiped, was faithful, and so on. And as he did, the Spirit of God revealed to him that he was going to see the Messiah before he graduated from this life. So he showed up at the temple, led by the Spirit, and he met Jesus. And I thought, what a beautiful picture for us. Is, you know what? Each one of us has an appointment to meet him in some of the darkest and most difficult challenges in our life. The question is, are we looking for him? Right in the middle of heartache, difficulty, disappointment, and so on, Jesus shows up. Are you looking for him? In young life, we used to sing a song. I would sing it for you, but that would be embarrassing for all of us. Uh, uh, it, it, it goes like this. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look. Open your eyes. He'll show it to you. We meet him in the strangest places. I met him at Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C. He showed up every day. Amazing times. Incredible things happened. I went away so thankful that I'd seen him clearly right in the midst of having cancer, that word that evokes fear in so many people. I met him there, just like Simeon met Jesus in the temple. He shows up in the strangest places. There's one other person. You ever hear about her either? Her name was Anna. There was also present Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, who was a prophetess. She was a very old woman, having had seven years of married life and was now a widow of 84. She spent her whole life in the temple and worshiped God night and day with fastings and prayers. She came up at this very moment, praised God, and spoke about Jesus to all those in Jerusalem who were expecting redemption. So there's Anna. You never hear about her anywhere else in Scripture, just this lone verse in Luke chapter 2. She shows up and she sees Jesus. Wow. He's still doing it, everybody. He's showing up in the strangest places to meet us in our most difficult challenges, just like he met me right in the midst of cancer. I'm so grateful. I look back on that experience with thanksgiving. I just as soon I didn't have it again. They told me they got it all. But you know what? That's up to him too. So what is it for you as you look at this Christmas season where Jesus wants to meet you right in the midst of your challenges, your difficulties, and your struggles? I want to read that passage once more in 1 John 4 because I think it says so clearly for us what his words to us would be. 1 John 4, 17 and 18. So our love for him grows more and more, filling us with complete confidence for the day when he will judge all people for we realize that our life in this world is actually his life lived in us. Love contains no fear. Indeed, fully developed love expels every particle of fear. I like that. And remember, love is a person, isn't it? tells us God is love. The one who dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. For fear always contains some of the torture of feeling guilty. The man who lives in fear has not yet had his love perfected. So 
we have the privilege this Christmas season to experience Emmanuel, God with us, right in our midst. I um, don't know if you've had a chance to see the video that Chosen. If you haven't, do yourself a favor. They, they had year one with eight one-hour parts, year two with one, eight one-hour parts, and it's just different stories in the Gospels. And I'll tell you, every time I watch it, I meet Jesus in a deeper way. He's just wonderful. My wife and I were at the Museum of the Bible two weeks ago in Washington, and they did the beginning of year three, and the first part of it was the uh, Mary and Joseph and the birth of Jesus. You know what I loved about it? <laughs> Most of the time when you see the manger scene, the straw is always really clean, isn't it? Everything is scrubbed. It's just such an immaculate scene. I loved what they did with this. It starts out, and Joseph is kind of sweeping some of the animal droppings out of the way. It's filthy, dirty. It smells, okay? And that was the manger that Jesus came to be born in. And you know what a manger is, by the way? It's a little trough, usually made out of stone, that donkeys and horses and cows drink from. It's dirty. They show <laughs> They showed that manger, and they put Jesus. They put a blanket in there, but they put Jesus in there. And it, it wasn't clean at all. And I thought, wow. He entered this world in a stable that smelled of animal droppings. Why? Because he wanted every one of us to know he meets us right where we are in the most difficult places the most dirty places, Jesus shows up. Uh, I just loved the scene. By the way, uh, they had some of the actors that were there, and Mary and Joseph were sitting right behind my wife and I. <laughs> what, but what a wonderful enactment of what took place and is described in Luke chapter 2, the birth of Jesus. Okay, And that stable, it wasn't scrubbed clean, everybody. There were a whole bunch of animals in there. It probably smelled the high heavens. And Jesus was born there. He came to bring us life right in the midst of all the difficulty and the dirtiness of life. He did. I want to close by reading you a little something that uh, this family of friends that I'm involved with, it's a worldwide family, um, this year, we're actually not going to have uh, a national prayer breakfast as we've had the last 70 years because of COVID. It's going to be virtual, which disappoints me. But can you imagine 3,500 people from 150 countries <laughs> all jammed into the Washington Hilton? And it probably would be a COVID factory, wouldn't it? But we're still going to get, you know, there, several hundred congressmen will meet together and it will be live streamed around the world. But this family of friends, sent out a little something a year or two ago to kind of describe what it is that we're committed to, and I'd like to read it to you. I think it is really a helpful reminder of Jesus' followers and what we're about. Followers of Jesus are from many nations. They care about each other enough to gather together in small groups on a regular basis. They think together, discuss together, pray together, and play together in order to learn little by little to love unconditionally, serve God and not money, humble themselves, give without seeking a return, empower and not control, show mercy, not revenge, seek justice and freedom for all people, encourage and not discourage, spread hope, and not despair, believe, and not doubt. They've decided to seek to do this together in order to establish throughout the world a revolution of love so powerful that the division and animosity separating people and nations, boy, isn't that as high as it's ever been right now, the division and animosity separating people and nations will be greatly eliminated or replaced by the spirit of forgiveness and reconciliation 
as modeled by Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said this can only be accomplished by the transformation of the human heart, by the power of God and not man, which is causing them step by step to begin to think like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, love like Jesus. As he is in this world, so are we. This then is creating a climate throughout the world where men and women will find that the order of the day is to see the invisible, to believe the incredible, to hear the inaudible, to do the impossible. In spite of the fact that many think this is an unachievable dream, a follower of Jesus is learning to become a better citizen, not only as a part of their own nation, but as a citizen of the world. They're learning on a day-to-day -day basis what it means to love God and to love their neighbor as themselves. They are brothers and sisters according to the command of Jesus. And finally, they're learning to love and forgive their enemies. They're experiencing in some small degree the liberating power of doing unto others what they would want others to do unto them. After I walked out of the hospital on October 29th, less than 24 hours later, I hopped on a plane to Moscow to begin a 25-day trip to five different countries, uh, including Russia and Ukraine and Armenia, um, Iraq, the Kur Kurdistan, Iraq. Uh, just a wonderful time with a whole lot of friends. Um, and so grateful that Jesus met me right where I was, you know, right in the middle of having cancer, and really showed me his love and his presence in powerful ways. So finally, everybody, as you experience this Christmas season, Remember, they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Is he with you in every one of your trials and challenges and problems? He sure wants to be. He wants to be in us and radiate through us his love to every person we encounter. One of my favorite Christmas carols, the kids sang it here. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Have you prepared him room in even the darkest corners of your life? It would be the best Christmas present you could ever give Jesus is just prepare room for him in every part of your life. And he will love you back in ways that you can't imagine. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.